um, we're working with HomeShare, Vermont, um, and Burlington Business Association. And HomeShare is looking at putting together a guide as well that would help people through, uh, walk through that process locally. Um, because it can be really daunting, because you have to remember these, the people who are building ADUs, they're not developers, they're homeowners. Um, and they could be very new to this process. Um, so navigating that can be challenging for many people. So has HomeShare Vermont um, gotten involved in ADUs in the past? Or they consider those separate units where it's really not a home share? No, they do. They, they, they see a tremendous amount of potential for ADU, so they're really supportive of them because a lot of people who want to participate in home share, they still want to have their own space. Right. And they don't necessarily want somebody inside of the home. And they, you know, because maybe perhaps the home share arrangement is help with transportation or grocery shopping, home maintenance, right. things like that. So it, it can be a really nice living situation. Do you know the impact on property taxes when someone converts their house to a um, part of their house to an ADU? To the view. Is there automatically a reassessment of the value of the house? At that point? I'm sorry, I don't know. Oh, I'm sorry, good chief, whoever that is. <laughs> I'm sure the assessor at some point will come out because it's a type of renovation. Yeah. 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 So I have a couple of other resource materials that if you're interested in them, I just don't want to load you with more paper, but this is the, it's called Making Room, and it's the, the change in demographics across the country. There's some nice national maps with some Vermont stats too. So, but this is, I, I found this publication came out about a year ago, extremely helpful. And then we also created the ABCs of ADUs. Um, so there's some great visuals um, for people to see how the different, the different um, ways that ADUs can be uh, built, either the internal conversions or the standalone um, ones. And is that specific for Vermont? No, this is just a broader <coughs> ADUs. Yeah, they're both national publications. But useful. Useful, I think Thank so. You. So, uh, send them around. Okay, Good idea. send them that way. Need to more faces. And I'll send these this way. Thank you. Get some ideas. Get some ideas. Yeah. Yes. You've already acted on like this, so you're way ahead of the game. This one's heavy. Oh, here you go, my dear. We should measure the weight. Here you go, Denise. Everything. I know, I know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you will work out, right? Oh, I like this one. I'm ready to move into one of these right now. Yeah. I'm ready. Yeah. Cargo. <laughs> After going through this stuff with our mothers, I am so done with things. <laughs> And here's, I can pass around to a copy of my testimony as well. Thank you. There you go. So, um, tell us about uh, your experience in Burlington, where things are, where things are going, and are, is ARP's focus mostly on Burlington, or are you working on this in other places around? The Our focus has been primarily in Burlington. Um, we have as I shared, you know, we've been working with the mayor's office um, and other stakeholders and some select city councilors as well. We brought out, we've been working with um, a consultant called um, Orange Spot. They're from Portland, Oregon, Eli Spivak. He has been working with us to take a look at the ordinance in Burlington to look at ways that it could be um, improved to be able to encourage more, the building of more ADUs. Um, and so the ordinance um, passed out of the Planning Commission unanimously back in December, and then it passed its second reading last night before City Council, and so it'll have a public hearing, I think, mid-February they're looking at, I think the second or third week of February, and then it'll go for third reading uh, before City Council. And they are looking at um, removing the parking requirement um, oh, yes, allowing for um, an, the permitting of it through administrative review and not through conditional use. They are looking at um, changing the 30% to a cap at 800 square feet across the board. A cap of 800, 800 square feet. Um, 
those were the three big ones. We're still we're still hopeful that perhaps we could get them to waive some of the uh, permitting fees for a short period of time to be able to encourage more the building of more ADUs, but um, that that one is uncertain still. So. How, does, how does that work now? Do you know? The the permitting now, this, well, there's been there's been some cases. So in Portland, Oregon, they waived. They they had sig pretty significant impact and permitting fees in Portland, Oregon, and they waived those for a set period of time, and they saw a significant increase. I could get you those numbers. I don't know them off the top of my head, um, but they did see it, that having a significant impact in the building of ADUs. So there's a permitting fee in Burlington. Bur Bur based upon how much money you put into the development? No, there's a number of different types of permits um, and impact, and the, the impact fee isn't, I want to say the impact fee is around $1,500 to $2,000, um, but there's other, there's other permits, perhaps Chris or Jacob could address the list of permits that are required. We didn't, we didn't do Burlington. Did we do some of Burlington? Yeah, we might have $2, the list. Okay. And about $2,000. And then there's a permitting fee for based on square footage, I think. So it's $2,000 $2, for permitting fees? No, like more. It's In Burlington. In Burlington. And, and to build 800 square feet, to, to renovate 800 square feet in Burlington roughly costs, what, $200 a square foot? Yes. So. It, it varied. Inside the building, it'd be cheaper than, you know, fixing up the Yeah, but work is work, right. That's $160,000. Yeah. Two, $2,000. And yeah, that was our point, was like, you know, the, it's a disproportionate cost you build a house for you know, you get more for your money building a house for two bikes. Maybe not in Berlin. You can't build a house probably in Berlin for 160000 For the fees, that's what our point is, but the, the, you can't do anything. Even if the fee was $5,000, it's not even 10% of it. I mean, it's like one, it's just over 1% of it. So the expert that we've been using from mm -hmm. Portland, Oregon, is yeah. focused on the Burlington ordinance, but there's ARP have like a um, other other ideas, you know, generic kind of ideas to promote ADUs other than the ones that are specific to the Burlington ordinance. If you go, if you have chapters around the country doing similar things, or they say, here's the ideal statute to deal with ADUs. Yeah, we do not have. Um a model statute, um, but we do have recommendations, and um, which are with some of the ones that I have gone through. So removing the parking requirement, providing, allowing for administrative review versus conditional use. Um, you know, addressing the square footage cap. Um, that one's big because it, you know there's it's unfair for small homes, and you know is more favorable for larger homes. So, um, so those are some of the, the recommendations that we that we support um, right. that would encourage it, encourage more to use. And I think, you know, the other piece is after legislation is providing some workshops and some opportunity for people who are interested in building ADUs to be able to participate in um, in workshops because they are homeowners. Um, and so being able to walk through that process with them, I think, is really helpful. Do you have a notion of uh, your membership in Vermont I, I, uh, and its demographic and how many, what percent of them own versus rent? I would have to look that up I mean, and get back to you. Because you guys collect a ton of data. We do. Yep. And you're a great mm -hmm. data resource. Mm -hmm. And um, it would be interesting, I think, for us to. Anyway. Mm -hmm. I even have my membership card here somewhere. So, rental versus home ownership? Mm -hmm. Anything else from their data that would be interesting to have? Because they have a they have a ton of data on this demographic for us as an economic development committee, independent of this issue. Well, so I guess I'd be interested in. I'm not sure it's data, but you know, around the world, mm -hmm. the use of ADUs in yeah. other countries, how that mm -hmm. has dealt with 
informal caregiving and right. stuff like that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that this isn't really a new concept. No, it's not. Well, I'm bad. Absolutely. It's it's not, you know, I mean, people you live together right. with their culture generational family members. Yeah. And it's yeah. only actually in the 20th century that that model has changed. Absolutely. And now, in some ways, here. it's going back. It's like what right. goes around comes around. Yeah. Exactly. yeah the, it's a traditional housing type that's reemerging, right? And um, I think treating ADUs the same way we treat single family homes will help encourage more ADUs. Um, so, Kelly, you said earlier on that you were supportive of the provisions in, yep. in 237. Yes. Mm -hmm. Some of those provisions, I'm trying to understand the juxtaposition of local municipal ordinances with this statute mm -hmm. and um, some of the things you're working on in Burlington be addressed by our legislation as well or it, it yes it, it, I mean it would uh, um, and they're keeping the owner occupancy in the ordinance in Burlington um, the only thing that would differ would be the the square footage Right, because you're striking that language, the 30%, um, and they put the 800 square foot. <clears throat> so, but right now, my understanding is, even if we didn't change the statute, a municipality can mm -hmm. do more than 30% mm -hmm. out to a square foot. Of right. I don't know if there's any limit. Is there a limit right now, statewide? Uh, statewide doesn't have a limit, yeah. but uh, a lot of municipalities set it at 30 percent or 800 or uh, here in there's 900. Plus so where you, whichever is greater, <clears throat> so it actually you can't go below 30. You can't tell somebody with a 3,000 square foot house that they can only build up to 800 square feet. That's what the statute says. It's a 30. The 30 percent is, is a base. Yeah, I want to look too quick for me. So if you have a 3,000 square foot house, you could. Right now, in state law, you can do up to 30 percent of 3,900 square feet, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, but a municipality could could go could in their ordinances could go even higher, right? Yes, they're allowed to be less restrictive. Each municipality, they can't be more restrictive. So, and does the the statute that we're dealing with that also moves this to administrative review, right? Um, no, that's that would be. But the municipality would have to choose that, uh, which they've done here in, in Montpelier, okay. and uh, that's what they're looking to do. In so, as an advocate for ADUs, um, I would assume, well, I guess I would like some feedback on that would be a big step if we said it's no longer conditional uses. Huge. <coughs> because there is a cost associated mm -hmm. also with the Develop Development Review Board. Um, and also, yeah, time too. Yeah, time. That's that's time that's. Money. But even the small checks, like I was saying, like every little bit, another check, another check, another check. So you could you, you, can you play? Can you play devil's advocate? Could you argue the other side? What we might hear from the league if we took away conditional use? Well, there's always you know the benefit of having things reviewed. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they can also be reviewed to death. I, I think it's just you know you can always get more information, more information, more information. But was like, at a certain point, you have to sort of rely on the experts in the room. I feel that that but understand the policy changes here, like like the Act of Fifty Duplicative Effort. It seems to me that make this simple, more affordable. Be you know, I've been on, on developer review boards and. We just like to ask a lot of questions, you know, even, like even, even beyond the authority. <laughs> uh, no, but you know, the flip side of it is, you, the flip side of it, yeah, we want to make it easier for people and less expensive. But we also, Sorry. excuse me, we also don't want uh, unthought, non-thoughtful, you know, higgledy piggledy, not attractive stuff going on in neighborhoods where people care what their neighborhoods look like. So I think we have to find sort of a fine line between honoring the, the character and, and visual aspect of a, a neighborhood and wanting to make it simpler. I mean, but I, I, I'm not sure doing away with all review is the answer to that. 
But if, if, if you ca if you allowed for administrative review um, based upon the variances that are allowed, right? And if somebody wants to go outside of the box that you've created, then it could you know then you go through conditional use. But if you're creating the parameters of what an ADU should be, right? Then you should allow for that process to be smoother and easier. Right. Right. I can see, for instance, one solution might be. If you're doing an ADU within an existing structure, right. that maybe you don't have to go through a different mm -hmm. review board. Right, right. exactly. Structure. But if you were building a separate structure or building something that would affect the exterior, that there might be a simplified uh, conditional, conditional use. use review. Yeah, we wouldn't. If we wouldn't support that, but we'd want to see it both. If you if you're if you're providing the parameters for an ADU, you know you're putting specifically the amount of square footage you can have, right? The, um, and if it's a historic preservation, you're gonna have to go through that process regardless. Um, so that stay within. Is even so, so if there's a historic center, that would, that DRB stuff would still happen. It's an overlay review over, yeah. Got it. Okay. So you wouldn't be able, to, so you'd still stay within the character well, of the community. You could do experience in the work up in Burlington in terms of pushing for administrative review versus conditional. At this point, right. it's still in there that it's going to be administrative review. It's going to be administrative review. Anybody in the discussion push that back was on not, the That was not the hot topic. The hot, hot topic was parking requirement. That, that got quite a bit of discussion. Um, there's been quite a bit of discussion around owner occupancy as well. Um, but parking, parking, you know, creates, creates a pretty interesting discussion so there was but ultimately people agree you know there was there's consensus um, among the city councilors um, to get rid of that requirement so, so if, um, can you do a, a under state law can you do an ADU um, without owner occupancy no no what I guess I'm getting really into the basics here. Well, uh, oh, it's a concern that okay. interplays with our short-term rental oh. issue, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. Because if there has to, because to me that would be critically important for ADUs is that it has to be over-occupied. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing, yeah. Well, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm really talking out off the top of my head. I'm just trying to get back to the basics here. What is the advantage of the ADU statute? Well, if somebody tried to, put a unit in their house and didn't live there, they basically want to be renting a duplex at that point? The idea what you also, yeah, that's what, it, that's what it would turn out to, is that developers would look for houses on the market that have a big backyard and they would just buy it um, and then build an ADU as well. So it would create the housing, but it's, it's here in Burlington is that you would have uh, you know ten people in the house, four people in the ADU, you could get loaded with students, of course, is always the concern. And having owners on site really helps. I guess I'm, just, I, I'm, I'm asking a very fundamental question back to our ADU. What's the advantage of what what advantages does the ADU statute give to somebody that we require there to be an owner occupancy over if there was no owner occupancy? Um, Oversight. It's the it's the neighborhood of people taking good, better care of their own homes. And they, if the owner's in one of the units, mm -hmm. because they could people do move into the ADU and rent out the house um, and want to go back and forth and that type of thing. Um, I know, but I'm trying to get so, that, so I'm the, not being clear. I'm trying to say go back to one past our law. Which what has owner occupancy. You require what were you giving as an advantage to the homeowner uh, over just a renting both units out separately. What, what, do you, what do you get? Do you get tax savings? you get permanent savings? you get, what, what do you get by staying in the unit and occupying it? You get occupied? to call it an ADU and it becomes, it can remain your primary residence and it can remain a single family home. So that, with it comes a lot of advantages being you, know, you can make decisions. There's actually, I don't like to say it only, but the, the fair housing laws are different in ADUs. There are some uh, 
their housing laws? They're, they're slightly different. Uh, so why should we create an ADU? And you have now, in effect, two occupants to this, this residence. What if the owner dies? What if the owner sells the property? What happens to the two? You know, you created an apartment, you spent money to do it, and now you have a new owner. And the owner doesn't live there. Does the, do the rules change? Unfortunately, uh, Burlington uh, asks that you, uh, upon transfer, you remove the kitchen. So now it just becomes a rec room of sorts. Yeah, um, real advantage the next, the next. Somebody. Right. So uh, getting comments on, especially that's why I see the advantage of having, uh, you know, incentives to get people to build homes because now we can, we're put, attaching the deed. We can say it's affordable for this long sale or transfer. We can start to make make those rules on people. I mean, they'll agree to them. No, uh, I'm sorry, I, but, I missed exactly what what you would intend to do in terms of ch change that situation. I mean, these are all, it's, it's homeowner choice, you know, they, would they, if they build it and decide to incentivize it. But at this point, um, well, they didn't intend to die. <laughs> <laughs> right, or right. of course, or whatever the life-changing situation is, correct. But, I think um, but what, are you proposing some sort of a change that in the event of those events to override the municipality? Oh, no, 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 no this, is, these are, this is thoughts to what, what will happen in that situation, I think, is more, that's what the discussion is now. Right now, we're still on the basics of, where can people park? So the, the well, I mean, I think, it's, I think fundamentally germane to any decision that we make regarding this, because you know what what happens before you create the ADU is all well and good. That's clear, but what happens after is critical. And it's certainly critical for people to understand what they're getting themselves into. Right. Well, I mean, let's still go on the market as a single family home with an accessory dwelling unit. Those, uh, in the market. And then you have a choice of either keeping it or absorbing for an of the house, which right. we did. When we bought our house in Woodstock, there was an accessory dwelling unit uh, on the second floor, and we obliterated it and made it a one family home again. So you, you, you deflated the, potentially what you've done is you conflated the value in the market of your home if you had an accessory dwelling unit long term. I didn't because we created a six bedroom one family home. Yeah. So no, no, I'm saying not in your case. I'm saying in general. Yeah. You potentially just you have the But that's your choice to make. Yeah. If, you're buying if, the if house. you buy the house, you yeah. can reabsorb it or you could keep it. Now I'd love to have that accessory dwelling on it again, but in a different place on one floor. <laughs> and, and I like to be in it. <laughs> I think there is market value when people are looking for a home. Um, is either the possibility for an ADU or whether or not the ADU exists already um, to be able to provide some of that flexibility to your living arrangements. Yeah. yeah. And we're dealing, I think, like with a bubble coming through here where the ADU is a, a reasonable um, option for mm -hmm. families that have elderly parents or whatever and what happened, as you said. Right. When there's many different living arrangements that can take place in a single family home with the ADU. Um, it does provide a lot of potential. Uh, and new um, value, I think, we're, what you're saying is there's sort of a new appreciation for the opportunity. Yeah. And that desire for a smaller home for, for many people That's is increasing. So if, if the dwelling is still considered a single family home, how do you do taxes, like any deductions for that? particular unit. I don't know. Just it's the, it's, yeah, it, yeah, it's income producing, so it yeah, yeah, counts the rental unit. Yeah. And then you get the square footage section off and, and do it as a deduction in that way. So the same way it is, you would do it do for a home a office. Like a home office or something like that. Yes. Right. <laughs> can, you, um, can you make a, a a separate unit that has a sort of a common entrance. You walk down, you come to one entrance, walk down the hall, and you split the two to one entrance. Can you do that without any special permit if it's not an ADU, or do you fall into a different category? If you have, I'm still struggling with this concept of owner occupied and the concept of you getting an ADU and what. There must be, in addition to fair housing standards, that would not be applicable on ADU. There must be something else that makes this attractive to be an ADU versus. Here, just a single family neighborhood, you can only have 
of single family. So mm -hmm. an ADU was a loophole that allowed you to create a oh, single family. Exactly. Oh, okay. 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 But also, right. what about the uh, question I answered earlier about assess valuations? Do, do you see when you create these things that the assessor comes in and says, now you've got a different value and yes. increased property values? So yeah. uh, a lot of times internal conversions will actually can bring down if there's an assessed and the appraised value. The assessed value uh, sometimes goes up and the appraised value goes down, which is strange. Um, but the assessor during there, we have the, the Montpelier assessor waiting on an apartment that uh, will be done until this Friday. They were in there right away before, <laughs> before we got our certificate box and so they're, they're, on, they're on it. So, uh, but I've found that the taxes don't increase very much. Usually it's only because of improvements done to the whole home at the same time, which a lot of people do because you already got, the, once you get a plumber in your house, you're like, fix this, fix that, or whatever, you know, it's like you gotta get that that done. Uh, but with detached units, there is a significant increase in both the uh, assessed and appraised uh, value. You, you will be looking at a couple hundred bucks a month to increase taxes usually with the detached unit. Sorry, with the detached, it tends to go up? That's been, yeah. that's been my experience. I would assume that. Yeah. So just, Chris, go back full circle, but thank you for that. That was the missing piece. So if you're in a, in a zone, uh, uh, in a zone in a, that allows for duplexes, you don't even have to bother using the ADU law? No, I mean, if that's what you want to do, is use, and that's a provision in your, in your proposal, is um, provisions that enable duplexes where there are still no So it's another route to get there. Is there some possibility that you can use the ADU in a, in a zone that's for duplexes where you have to, the size of the independent unit may have to be a certain square footage, and this will allow you to do smaller by doing an ADU? I guess it's conceivable. Okay. All right. We're right on schedule. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to clarify, so I'm going to follow up on the home share stats yeah. and a copy of the ordinance in Burlington and then a member data uh, rentals versus home ownership. Yeah. Was there anything else that I did? Is that good? Mr. Chair, may I ask one question Absolutely. before we go? I've been studying this um, chart on page 13. This is oh, phenomenal. Thank you for bringing that yeah. yeah, I just, um, I'm wondering if we look at single person households um, in New England, why is Vermont the outlier there in terms of Compared percentage? to other, yes. other uh, New England states, yes. with similar, particularly with Northern we New England. Some, yeah, similar, similar demographics. Yep. What's mm -hmm. going on there? Do you know? No. Okay. Yeah. Can you find out for me? I will. I'll look at you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. I, it's, it's very striking. Yes, it is. Thank yeah. you. you know the Buffalo, which is at 41 percent. I did notice that. <laughs> yeah. Is there another uh, copy of the ABCs of ADU that I did not Oh, I'm sorry. These are very I, helpful. I, is, is, is it in there? Is it in there? No. I will. I will. Oh, okay. perfect. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very Thank much. you. Okay, yeah. <laughs> no, one last question. Yes, you yeah. said there's no model statute floating around, but is there a jurisdiction, a municipality, or a state that ARP points to as having like the model. Best, best law? Uh, no, not off the top of my head. There are on this, in this piece, there is um, a section on here that talks about. Is that a document from the Planning Association that yeah, talks about that key features, good. like things mm -hmm. you should definitely yeah. you know, consider? Um, that we sent you on Friday. Come on in. You can come on in. Yeah, we're just, we're just about to change gears here. Mm -hmm. I'll look into that week and follow up. So the one more other piece of data just to follow up on Becca's um, observation of this is do would you have data uh, with your members in mm -hmm. Vermont about whether how many are living alone and how many are living in the context of, of a family. Of a family. Mm -hmm. Okay, I bet you have that too. Yep. Mm -hmm. It would be that yep. would be also very interesting for us because I dare say right, there's a lot of variables there. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much.
Stay in touch. Well. Don't despair. This is great. I have to say, all these Excel suits are so great. Right? You're like, I don't know. Put you in one, put Oliver in another. In front of our committee, so we have a, a group of people. I'm not sure who's in charge here. Captain Sims? Yeah, she's yeah. stuck in the um, press conference upstairs, so Joe okay. is going to introduce us. Everybody. You're going to just introduce yourself when we get started? Yeah. Okay. And we have some more chairs here. Center, and I am, I'm standing in for Catherine Sims, who's the executive director of the Northeast Kingdom Collaborative. They are upstairs uh, finishing a, a press conference. Um, but we are here uh, today uh, as part of uh, NEK Day, Northeast Kingdom Day, uh, at the State House uh, with the theme of, of rural innovation, what's working and what's next for the Northeast Kingdom. So there are close to 100 of us, <laughs> I think, here today uh, sharing uh, what we're excited about uh, in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, and ways that uh, we hope uh, the state and state policy can, can support that work. So I'm going to introduce uh, colleagues today and then and cede the table to them. Uh, so uh, Luke Sussdorf um, is an alumni from uh, Northern Vermont uh, University. Uh, we hope to have Jesse Upton. Has Jesse arrived? Um, uh, from uh, Whetstone and then myself uh, all talking about um, I think different aspects uh, or issues of interest to this committee relating to economic development uh, in the Northeast Kingdom. So Jesse, or I'm sorry, Luke, pick us off. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for your time. My name is Luke Sustorf. I am the manager of special events at JP Resort, and I graduated from NVU Linden in 2012. Um, I first discovered NVU Linden through my father, William Sustorf, who, like me, is a Linden State College alumnus. After working as a certified snowboard instructor for eight years and attending Adirondack Community College near my hometown of Diamond Point, New York, where I graduated with an associate's degree in liberal arts, I had an interest in learning more about the ski resort industry and more importantly, how to develop a career in an industry that had already had such a positive impact on my life. And NVU Linden was the vessel that turned that into an attainable reality. From studying general resort operations to more specialized programs like lift maintenance, grooming, and risk management, each class I attended while at NVU Linden flowed from one to the next. It was a fantastic small classroom learning experience that offered so much insight into all of the small details that go into operating a successful ski resort. To be honest, I couldn't get enough. While at NVU Linden, I had the opportunity as a student to intern at several different New England resort properties, gaining firsthand experience working in numerous departments, uh, shadowing frontline employees, supervisors, managers, directors, and even in some cases, resort general managers. 
I now manage JP Resorts internship program with NDU Linden, and it feels great to give back to an institution that helped kickstart my career as a ski resort operator. May I just ask you a question there? Sure. Um, given we do a lot of workforce development issues, that internship and apprenticeship, was that a registered apprenticeship? Did you get a cert certification for that? Is that a hospitality internship I or apprenticeship? I did not for the initial one. It was called practicum, a pra practicum course. Um, but then I'll keep going with my testimony, and I ended up did gaining some certifications Great. through my, my full-time internship. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so the, the internship, the practicum opportunities that we have the established relationship between JP Resort and NV Linden, it's also a great opportunity for JP to recruit uh, its new you know, NVU students as potential resort employees. And as a final requirement to graduate, graduate with a bachelor's degree in science in the field of ski resort management, I had to complete a summer long internship at a resort property. And I chose JP. So as the JP intern, I worked in a number of different departments, places like the hotel front desk, the golf course, the pump house indoor water park, customer service, parking and security, food and beverage, and I eventually found myself working on the events and marketing team where I've been since the fall of 2012. I've been the manager of special events at JP since the fall of 2014, so I'm responsible for directing the year-round on and off snow event series for the resorts. I coordinate the JP music series and much more. I found a second home in the J area, and I must thank MDU Linden and JP for helping make that possible. It's opened doors in my life that, frankly, I never knew existed, not to mention lifelong friendships and countless great days playing outside. It's also where I met my now wife, a fellow JP employee, a native Vermonter, and an NVU Linden alumnus. And my sister-in-law has the sign in her living room that reads, if you are lucky enough to live in the Northeast Kingdom, you are lucky enough. And now living in Vermont full time for almost a decade, I couldn't see myself anywhere else, uh, especially living in the Northeast Kingdom. The quality of life we as Vermonters possess is something very special. And in my case of being a native New Yorker and now being converted Jay, I will forever be indebted to NBU Linden and to Jay Peak for helping set the stage of a lifelong career doing what I love in an environment that I love. Thanks again, everybody, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's great. As an Adirondacker, I'm particularly interested. You went to ACC and then came to Bid. Um, I'm just curious on your wages, because one of the concerns in the Northeast Kingdom is some of the lowest per hour wages in the state. Yep. So I'm just curious what Jay Peak is doing to improve that situation uh, in the hospitality industry for famously low wages. Uh, if we're trying to move towards a little wage all yeah. over Vermont, what are you doing? I mean, are you working to promote, and what are you doing in terms of to improve wages in the hospitality industry? Well, uh, we've certainly made a lot of strides within the last few years. I mean, I remember when I started at Jay, I mean, mind you, I was an intern, but I was hired on as a full-time employee, so it was a paid position. We were at a wage freeze during that time. So, and I knew kind of coming in bare bones, you know, I had to just work as hard as I could and just kind of tough it out for a couple years, and then it would get better as things went on. And it certainly has, and really since, um, you know, the spring of 2016, ironically, it's, things have gotten much better for not only frontline employees, um, but for someone like myself that's moved from an hourly position with overtime eligibility to now being full-time year-round salary, um, aside from, you know, benefits, you know, health insurance, or 401k, um, it, it's gotten much, much better. Because um, that is a, a, a big issue. It's a huge issue. Not only finding, you know, recruiting new talent and, you know, having to be competitive with, with our wages and feel like as a resort, that's something that we've really put in the primary focus within the last few years. Um, because the reality is, I mean, we can't sustain ourselves as, as JP, I mean, the size of the operation, we can't sustain ourselves as if, if we don't have quality staff and if we're not taking care of, of staff, the current ones and recruiting new ones. Yeah. And uh, just to go to our housing concern, because we're also the committee that does housing, yes. 
what are your housing challenges? Do you have a housing challenge for your employees? How does it affect your recruitment? It's improved within the last couple years since we added on um, on-site employee housing. Um, some of the condominium projects that were going on at JP, um, the management team decided to make those uh, employee housing. So that certainly helped with some of the seasonal departments like in the bigger departments like ski and ride school, for example, when um, I want to say you know, they have upwards of a couple hundred instructors working on, on that team. And it's a, a seasonal department, so you have to somehow sustain yourself and, and, and do that in a way that you know, makes sense for you, the employee. Um, so having the on-site housing has definitely been a pretty big improvement. Um, you know, local area lodging, it's, it's coming along. Um, you know, we're seeing slightly a, a slight decrease in available lodging properties for employees, um, just you know, with Airbnb and HomeAway and just a lot of other rental opportunities. Some homeowners are choosing to do that as opposed to having you know a full-time tenant living in, in their residence. Um, so that's kind of nice that the resort has been able to step up to the plate and offer another option, and I mean, frankly, a cheaper option um, right there on site um, on resort. That's terrific, and then they take it. An employee would take that as an additional benefit with their seminar. Yeah, and it's also a recruitment opportunity that we use to hire staff. Um, you know, that's one of the most common questions that's asked, especially going back to ski and ride school when it's a seasonal department. Sure. Folks are like, oh, I'd love to commit with you for the season. Where can I live and how much does it cost? Well, um, that's what I would ask. So yeah. how much of your staff is seasonal? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, let's see, just about, <coughs> just about half, if not more than, than half. You know, especially um, you know, food and beverage is another department. The, those profit centers, how many there are, um, you know, we will certainly go down to a more streamlined operation during the off the off snow months. Um, but J Peak is kind of unique though in that you know you have not only skiing and riding, but you have the conference center, the wedding business, the golf course, the water park, the music series, recreation center. I mean, you name it, we likely have it or at least have something close to it. Um, and that being said, there's certainly a need to have folks employed year-round to execute and operate all those various things. And, and with regard to your internship, how many um, students, I assume, do they all, all come, most of them come from uh, NBA? Yeah, yeah, I'd say um, about 100% of our interns come from, from NBA Linden specifically. Um, you know, on average, we see about half a dozen students that come to us throughout the season that will shadow in a, a number of different departments, being back of house and front of house. It's up to the student whether they choose to do a full-time internship with us, you know, like a season-long internship. Um, and we recently had one, I believe, is a, a senior this year graduating. And, I hope we hire him once he graduates, who's with us over the summer. And so. it's, that, it's that pretty uh, reasonable to think that the interns would be hired full time. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's a, it's beneficial. I mean, it's a two-way street in that, you know, the resort, we look at, at the student as someone that has gone through a specialized program in the resort and hospitality industry. They already kind of have the framework set for them to succeed. So that's very enticing as a potential employer to see that in someone. And also for the student, um, you know, I was a very unique opportunity in that I walked into a full-time job immediately out of college, and I really didn't have to scramble a whole lot. I mean, I and I thank my internship for that. I mean, that really was able to set the stage for me to move into a full-time position. And that's not always the case. Um, you know, usually you graduate and you kind of have to figure it out. Um, so the internship opportunity is it's very beneficial both ways. And what's the name of that program at NBU? Um, this the we call it the practicum program. But what's the hospitality program? Oh, resort hospitality. It's mountain mountain recreation management. Yep. I change names right after I yeah. 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 Outdoor educational leadership and tourism. Yeah. And I, and I know we're a little limited on time, and there are two other witnesses. Yeah. We are yeah. hoping to bring, so just wanted to check in about. Right. But these are the issues we're working on. So we're really, yeah. really well, interested. That's why we're right here. <laughs> and the housing. <laughs> but we all do have a hard stop at 11. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So that program's called Outdoor. Outdoor Education, Leadership, and Tourism. Thank you. It's a Bachelor of Science degree. And there's several concentrations within it, and it's on, it's on both campuses. Perfect, thanks. That's Hi. very helpful. Hello. Hello. My name is Jessie Epson. I'm one of four sisters who are a sixth generation to grow up in our family's farmhouse in Craftsbury, Vermont. 
Two years ago, when our parents were getting ready to retire and downsize, two of my three sisters and I came together to try to keep the farmhouse in the family. Our backgrounds ranged from nurse to teacher to herbalist to stay-at-home moms. None of us had any experience in business, but we felt we had a vision and a pulse in the community's needs, and with that, we invested in the future of our childhood home. In May of 2018, we took over the one side of the building that was run as a B&B by our grandparents and then by our parents, and completed some renovations and reopened as a vacation rental property. On the second side of the building, we opened Weststone Wellness, where we offer yoga classes, hot tub and sauna, massage, facials, Reiki, sound therapy, and counseling. The Wellness Center has not only provided local job opportunities, but it has also quickly become popular with both community members and those visiting from out of town. We were not quite through our first year of business when it became evident that the fluctuating income of vacation rentals was making it hard to pay our bills during the slower months. We realized that in order for this business to be sustainable, we needed more fixed monthly income. That's when we were approached by a good friend about turning the downstairs or vacation rental into a restaurant and bar. There has been a huge demand for a place to dine in Craftsbury for quite some time, even present on the town's five-year plan to create such a place. As soon as we reached out to our local planning committee, select board, and neighbors, we were met with nothing but excitement and support. With that, in December of 2018, we revised our business plans and jumped into the Act 250 process with the goal of opening Blackbird Bistro by June of 2019. The next few months proved to be a crash course in the permitting process. We were determined to do everything we needed to do the right way and thought that by being proactive and starting the process in December, that we would be able to minimize the amount of time we would need to shut down our rental business for construction and would be able to launch the restaurant just as the prime summer season began. Unfortunately, we were met with the challenges of a permitting process that seemed flawed and it made it extremely difficult for small businesses to simultaneously do the things by the book and also open in a timely manner. It feels like everything from the application to the timeline to the support available is designed for large corporations with significantly more financial resources than are available to most small businesses, especially those just starting out. We submitted the application for the Vermont Division of Historic Preservation in January of 2019. We did everything we could to meet the demands of the historic resources specialist, even when it felt like the requests were really trying to prevent us from being able to move forward with our project a project that was designed to preserve history and keep an 1826 farmhouse in our family. Despite this frustration, we completed all the requirements in order to move forward. Then, three months later, one week before the rest of our Act 250 application was to be submitted, we heard back from the Historic Resources Specialist requesting a historical documentation package. We were given a quote of 2,700, but the consultant we were directed to contact told us that this is usually only required for buildings being demolished, not updated. To clarify, the footprint of our farmhouse would not be altered in any way. The only renovations would be some interior updates and kitchen remodel. The Act 250 specialist we were working with told us that the board might determine that this documentation package was unnecessary. When we reached back out to the historic resources specialist, explaining that time and money were tight and asking if this was something that we absolutely had to do, she told us no, but she could request a hearing over the issue, which would pro prolong our timeline even further. It was only weeks later that it came to light that we could actually complete the documentation package on our own. While taking quite a bit of time, it did save us $2,700. This was the beginning of what became a trend throughout our Act 250 process, asking the same question to three different people and getting three different answers, to trying to complete requirements ahead of schedule only to be thrown surprise curveballs at the last minute, and ultimately feeling a lot more pushback than support on the state level. This brings us to the final hurdle that almost ended our business before it even started. After receiving our Act 250 permit at the end of June, we were finally able to begin construction and start lining up contractors for our septic expansion. This work began full speed, speed ahead with the hopes of opening the restaurant in time to at least catch the leaf peepers. By the end of August, the construction was wrapping up and kitchen and wait staff were on call to begin training at any time. I knew that we needed to complete water testing prior to opening, so I reached out to the Agency of Natural Resources to find out exactly what they needed from us. This phone call ended up flagging an issue that we had been given the wrong water permit back in the beginning of July. They were told this was their error, but we would be looking at an additional water permit that would cost $35,000 to complete and would take an estimated six to 10 months. Needless to say, had this information been presented to us prior to construction, it would have called the project. I will spare you the infinite details, including the emotional toll this took on all of us and our families, but that's why we are here today. We are so happy to be a part of the economic growth in the Northeast Kingdom, and we sincerely hope that this Act 250 process can be streamlined to make it easier for Vermonters who are trying to raise their families in the state and who are trying to create successful small businesses that serve their communities. Thank you for your time. Are you open?
We are. We opened in December, a year later. Yeah. And have you submitted this testimony to the House Natural Resources Committee that's actually doing this work of streamlining Act 250? No, I have not. Well, that we're justifying. But we are testifying. No. Okay, great. Yeah. Right. Good, yeah. good, good. Because what does the whole process cost you, the, the permitting process? <clears throat> Um, so I did the work myself, but I've spoken to other people who have hired a consultant, and it cost them about 30000 to hire the consultant. And then um, the fees alone were another um, five, around 5000 And then um, Leanne, the owner of the bar, um, would have more details on how much it cost her um, and not being able to open until six months later. So lost revenue. But right. we lost on our Airbnb not being open. Um, and then uh, we obviously weren't charging her rent also. So and what, how long did the entire project take, the permitting part of it? A year. Oh, oh, the permitting. So we started, I started the application in December, and we got the Act 250 it, uh, permit in the beginning of July. But then the water permit that we were given the wrong one, we didn't get that until um, beginning of October. So that extended it almost a year. That's yeah. What it was like. And the consultant, you talk about the consultant, was that like an Act 250 navigator? Yeah, yeah. So um, my neighbor um, owns All Metals Recycling in Hardwick, and he told me that he um, hired someone to do everything that we did, and it cost him 30000 And is it a, generally the consultancy? <laughs> Now that we all know what navigators are with healthcare, I yeah. know she's a navigator with everything else. A lot of navigator. I know. Um, but the act of, is that a percent of the budget? Is that generally a fee that's based on a percent of the budget? So the fee for for the Act 250 permit is um, based on a percent of the budget. I'm not sure how the consultant um, comes up with their price, but okay. the fee, the Act 250 permit. Right. Yes, no, I know that, but the, I was just curious if yeah. the navigator, the consultant, was also a percent of the Yeah, I'm, budget. Not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Do you want to make sure that we get one, one last voice in? Yes, we'll have Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. And have you submitted that to electronically? Are these all going to be electronically submitted uh, to our we committee? Need we need that. Yes, thank you. Hello again, uh, Joe Short, uh, Vice President with the Northern Forest Center. We're a regional innovation and investment partner, a nonprofit uh, working to create rural vibrancy, connecting people, the economy, and the forested landscape, yes, all the way from the Adirondacks, Vermont, New Hampshire, and uh, into the main woods. As Vermont has recognized, attracting new residents is essential for your economic development. And I want to share a couple examples of work in the Northeast Kingdom to put the pieces in place that make the kingdom an attractive destination, not only for visitors, but for new businesses and residents. First is branding and marketing the region through experience. Incle increasingly amenity-rich places like the Kingdom are what people are seeking. Uh, and we're facilitating two initiatives to harness digital marketing and social media to tell the story of the Kingdom and introduce both locals and visitors to what it has to offer. Got a couple of props. Uh, the first is Get Naked VT. Um, yes, you laugh. It gets your attention whether you like it or not. Uh, and this is a campaign that highlights attractions, activities, and events that make the kingdom unique uh, and gives people a way to actively engage in those pursuits. You do a couple things in the kingdom, you win a free t-shirt, you know, things like that. Make it fun. Uh, since the campaign launched last June, we've had over 9,000 people use the site to plan their trips. Uh, most of those from Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, and Connecticut. We reach an average of 2,400 people a day through social and digital advertising. And the campaign content is curated by the, the local chambers, uh, anchor institutions like Catamount Arts. Second, and, and what about Canada? And your closest neighbor is Canada. Yes, yeah, so the, some of the marketing does go north. We're not, their, their content is not on the site, but we are advertising in, in Canada for those visitors. Second, and this one does cross the border, to your question, uh, is uh, Bike the Borderlands, uh, which is focused on leveraging the mountain biking community for community economic development objectives. This is a collaboration between eight trail networks across three states and Canada. Uh, it goes up to Circuit Frontier. Um, and did I get that right? Uh, and the group is working both to connect riders with new trail networks that they might not know about, but also with the local business communities. The, the Lotties are here in the front or the back of the room. They, you know, they're a local business in uh, in East Burke that has, I think, a bike borderlands placard in their in their window. Um, so we're trying to make sure that riders know, and we make it as easy as possible for them to spend some money 
uh, while they're while they're there. Uh, over 100 people com completed the inaugural tour to Borderlands last summer. They went to all seven of these, and that's each each one of those might account for about a thousand dollars in visitor spending. That's so great. The, the, it scales up quickly. Second set of initiatives uh, focuses on deepening economic development opportunities and employment tied to the working uh, landscape that underpins the Vermont brand. Uh, together, the Northern Forest Center and the Northeast Kingdom Collaborative have secured uh, over $400,000 in Northern Border Regional Commission funding to invest in outdoor recreation infrastructure. Uh, in partnership with the Vermont Woodworks Council, we've paired money from the Working Lands Enterprise Board uh, and federal and philanthropic money to work with uh, companies like Linden Furniture and Built by Newport uh, to strengthen their businesses that provide good jobs and markets for uh, Vermont wood. I know I'm going very fast, but I know you're pressed for time. So I'm going to cut right to uh, suggestions for state how state support can make each of these initiatives more effective. First is to invest more in marketing Vermont. Um, and I see that in some of the ACCD proposals. I work in several other states. Um, compared to those other states, the, the resources at the community level, not just the state level, you know, in your tourism agency, but resources that communities can access for their own marketing. Once upon a time, this work in the kingdom was funded, as I understand it, in part by the state. What I described to you now is all done on the backs of federal uh, philanthropic and individual support. And as you might expect, the ability to keep that marketing consistent, which is key for good marketing, uh, really waxes and wanes with funding availability. So state support to the extent it can be developed is important. Second is to continue to support the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. I, that initiative is unique. We talk about it in other states. You we help create it. We know. You're yeah. preaching to the converter. Okay. Uh, this well, we're, we're happy to hear that. Yeah. No, we're, we're <laughs> not just talking about it, but directly investing in it is is awesome. So okay. thank you and congratulations. Well, the governor's budget has a huge. Absolutely. So um, housing, since you asked about it, it wasn't on my list, but another shared regional issue. We, we have gotten into the property ownership business at the Northern Forest Center because we constantly hear from employers, hospitals who are trying to attract doctors, schools trying to attack teachers. It's not, a, not always affordable housing. It's quality housing. Yes. Um, and so I know you've got some, some ideas in front of you, and uh, again, I'm affirming those. Finally, I mentioned the Northern Border Regional Commission. This is federal money, but your ACCD has taken a really strong leadership role in really standing up that institution, uh, you know, the governor and Ted Brady, and I really urge that to continue. I, I would wager that at least half of the things folks are talking about here today are getting money from them. But federal money is not enough. You all know that it takes match, non-federal match, to go after that federal money. So your investment, those state dollars, are what help us leverage those dollars in. How much money is available there? They, they have got a $31 million appropriation. But between across, Maine to the Alabama. Across four states. But to, to put that in perspective, it was created in 2008, got its first appropriation of $1.5 million in 2010. So in less than 10 years, it's gone from 1.5 million to 31 million. Senator Leahy is a yeah. huge champion on this. Annually, um, and, and the lion's share is a quarter of it, or around that? Yes, without getting into all the details. Yeah, r roughly a straight divide by four. Have we been le leaving money on the table because you're on our state match? No, um, but I think you, you want to obviously use that money for the best projects that you can find. I know, you know, building a robust project pipeline of good projects that are ready to go and take advantage of that money can be challenging, not because they're not good ideas, but because of the match issue. Right. So that 31 million is spread between, from the Adirondacks to Maine. Four states. Right. And it includes all of Vermont, and not just includes all of Vermont. And initially, and one reason the kingdom has benefited so much is that initially it was just six counties, but in the right. last, um, uh, farm bill, they extended it statewide. So that month is speaking, if you got $8 million for Vermont, you'd have to raise how much to match that $8 million to get draw down the full $8 million? Uh, usually their projects want at least 50% match. They can do up to, uh, but sometimes it's just 20% match. So you'd need it anywhere from another uh, 2 to $8 million. What's the range of projects that they fund? Uh, projects that they, fund. they do a lot of infrastructure, you know, water sewer uh, type things, but they can also do the regional marketing work I talked to you is funded by that. Um, I think 
the outdoor recreation in Newport. Others can help me here. Um, workforce, um, uh, food systems, work. Uh, We're looking at broadband. Broadband, yes, thank you, Catherine. Uh, they can do a lot. It's a tremendously flexible pot of federal money. And, and, and so the, the Better Places program that's being proposed would be a great yes. example of a program where local state dollars could be used to leverage some of this MBRC money and, you know, a, a cross sector, um, uh, multi pronged place based initiative like Better Places, um, you know. Would be great match and also helps bring some of those other funders to the okay. table. To be okay. we, we need to go, and I apologize, but i um, uh, curious where is, do you know where in our budget that matching funds appear? Does anybody know that? Yeah. We so it's not only, Jane it's will not only state matching funds, but they also welcome projects and nonprofit and other matching funds. So it can be most, most of that, yeah, most of that match is not state money. But to the extent those, yeah, the, the BORAC Community Grants Program is another one, the, the Better Places, those small little bits uh, added with philanthropic and other money. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We may need you back on the Better Places. We'd be happy to come back. Um,